event, which is a uh, 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 I need to say, tell you, yeah, we'll be being recorded. So hopefully everybody's OK with that um, for this afternoon's event, which is um, our Northeast Yorkshire focus, Northeast Yorkshire focus um, titled Psychological Professions, Integrated Set Care System, Workforce Leads, a model for development and expansion. I should introduce myself. I'm Sharon Prince. I'm the chair for the Northeast Yorkshire Psychological Professions Network and also deputy director for the Psychological Professions in Leeds in York Mental Health NHS Foundation Trust. Um, uh, without any further ado, I'd like to uh, I'd like the presenters to introduce themselves. There will be a Q and A session at the end, um, so kind of please feel free to post any questions you have in the chat. Um, if people could keep themselves on mute, that would be really helpful. So uh, doesn't so we don't have background noise and uh, we aren't expecting any fire alarms during this session. I tried that one minute yesterday. It worked quite well. It's my um, remote joke. Uh, so anyway, so uh, <laughs> without any further ado, uh, hi, Gail and, and colleagues. Hi, um, my name's Gail Harrison. I'm a consultant a clinical psychologist and one of the aforementioned um, integrated care system, psychological professions workforce leads. So um, I also work in Leeds and York Partnerships Trust as one of the professional leads for psychological professions. I'll be leading most of today's webinar with my colleagues Rachel and Mike Will chip in, who's been Mike's been involved in the development of this with us. I'll pass over to Rachel so she can introduce herself. Hi, I'm Rachel Bradley. So I'm one of two South Yorkshire workforce leads for psychological professionals. And then um, the rest of my time I work in Rotherham in CAMS. Thanks, Rachel. Mike. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mike Lewis. I'm one of the two mental health program managers for the organisation formerly known as HEE, but is now part of the Workforce Transformation and Education Directorate within NHS England. Lovely. So I'm going to put up some slides. Bear with me while I do that technical bit. Um, and then talk you through what we've been doing in West Yorkshire. Um, which has broadened out across the whole region. Um, and as Sharon said, um, we're really keen to have a discussion and for people to be able to share their thoughts about their own regions and how the work we've been doing in, in um, northeastern Yorkshire might apply. And we can hopefully have a discussion at the end of today's webinar. OK, so here we go. Let's check it works. OK, it's there. So, so everybody here today will have hopefully come across these documents, our national workforce policy drivers within the NHS. We had the national long term plan some years ago now, um, followed up by the people plan. And then this last year, the NHS long term workforce plan. Now, Within these plans, there's some ambitious targets. The long term plan required a 60% growth from our 2019 baseline for psychological professions by 2024. And that's a third of the overall growth required in the mental health workforce. When I talk to colleagues in the wider system, they're still, I think, really shocked by this, that the psychological professions aren't expanding to that degree. I must say that that also includes the mental health support teams from schools within that growth figures. So in the long term workforce plan this year, we are to grow the training places for clinical psychology and child and adolescent psychotherapy by 26% by 2031 to 32. And that's an extra thousand people up to 2028, 29. So a lot of people and that's that just those two professions a huge number more of the psychological therapists and psychological practitioners. So we've got some national psychological professions policy drivers, which is important to set our talk of what we're doing in, in our region within this context. So until recently, it, it is still quite shocking, I think. There's, there's been no national or regional professional leadership 
for psychological professionals. And it is thanks to the PPN and the leadership of our colleagues that we do now have a national psychological professional lead in Adrian Whittington. But so our groups of professions are really poorly understood, I think, still in workforce planning more generally. And that means that our full potential remains to be realised. So the National Psychological Professions Workforce Plan sets out five priorities. I can't do it justice here today, but I'm sure most people will be aware of it. That's to grow our professions, develop those people already in post, to diversify so that we have um, attract um, more people into our professions that represent the communities we serve, with a focus on leadership. And I think that's that's our main focus here today because leadership is crucial at all levels in terms of um, meeting the strategic aims of these plans and to transform services with new roles and new ways of doing things and innovation. The National Vision for Psychological Professions is a um, document that sits alongside these, this and has these five commitments within it. So we really want to put people first at the centre of this and help our communities to thrive. Psychological professions have all the core skills to help contribute to this, both within NHS, voluntary sector services and in public health. We're really ambitious here, aren't we? Make all health and care psychological, but certainly my contributions and my colleague Dorothy Frizzell sitting on the West Yorkshire Clinical Care and Professional Leadership Forum have been noted in that people are very, very keen, the other professionals, to have us there and offering our view and voice and linking different parts of the system together. We want to be able to unite and increase diversity in the psychological professions. And I think that that really feels that this is coming alive in weeks like this with PPN week, that we can learn and listen to each other and transform and innovate. So all of those um, aims are laudable, but how does that link to what we've been doing here? So there are many challenges. You'll notice from the presentation now on in there'll be a quiz at the end, a number of bridges, because I'm sure Rachel and um, I will agree that our role is very much a bridge, has one element of being a bridging role, bridging between different parts of the system, between different places across the region, linking local, regional, national at times. So we started off with, with I'm not going to tell you which bridge it is, but this one's pretty, mu pretty much a huge engineering endeavour that required a lot of teamwork, I imagine, planning and organisation to, to realise. So our challenges for the workforce articulated in these plans. We have a range of professions. Sharon will correct me, but I think it might be 20 now. It was 12 when, when, when I started in post. We have a range of settings that we work within. Mental health has often been um, our main focus, and that's what people think of, I think, in the main when they think of psychological professions, especially in the NHS. But we also work in physical health settings and primary care settings and acute settings and other community settings as well. And, and prisons and wider. Increasingly, we're partnering with voluntary sector and social enterprise providers. And the pathways between our, our workers and for, for people using our services between these different sectors are sometimes complex, but are developing in line with different integrated care systems priorities. So we have a lot of different work streams. Each integrated care system will be organised slightly differently, but have, have things they're mandated to deliver. And um, so navigating those systems is important to know where we will make most impact and add most value. We've got lots and lots of training opportunities for psychological professionals. Um, Mike um, the, is the fount of all knowledge on, on this, but it's, it's kind of maximising those training opportunities and linking to what is required both at trust level, ICS level and system level to support that and ensure people can take them up. So there's huge variation across different places. West Yorkshire is made up of um, four different places, but other ICSs are made up of a lot more. So that can be really, really challenging um, in terms of communication channels, timescales of things, money, 
all sorts of things. We know, and I'll say a bit more about this later, that reliable data for our workforce um, has been lacking and but is improving and we do have more information on that. And one of the challenges I think is there's we can't control the context. It's always changing. And that um, with it, like Mike said about Health Education England changing, NHS England changing, that can become um, create additional challenges, but also can create opportunities. So before my time, before I was in post, um, the, the, the West Yorkshire sort of grappled with these national strategies and thought, how are we going to make a difference here? So credit to those people, Sharon included, who led this and developed the Psychological Professions Workforce Steering Group. That was established in 2020. So I think during the pandemic, people really got together and tried to work effectively so that they could, we could provide maximised opportunities for the development of the West Yorkshire staff wellbeing hub being a key um I guess output really from that. But this this um culture of working together rather than in competition has really given opportunity for us to develop the strategy which we see here. So the psychological professions workforce strategy for West Yorkshire was developed and launched in 2021. And with all of this work to do with this massive expansion um, people already had um, very busy jobs working within their organisations at place. So some lobbying was done, supported by um, our mental health, learning disability and autism workforce lead, Sonia Robertson, and other colleagues within the integrated care system to collectively fund the psychological professions workforce lead role from ICS funds. So my role on a pilot basis. So I was I was recruited to that role and came and started working in October 2021. It's a bit of a baptism of fire, I have to say. I think most of the working at place within trusts, we don't necessarily, didn't at that point anyway, know anything about integrated care systems and what um, how to navigate that. But I think I've really, really stepped up to that and, and naturally enjoy understanding systems, people, networking. And those qualities, I think, have been really important in navigating this role and making the most of it. So I think I can say a lot about this, but what are the overall themes here in terms of West Yorkshire? Just going to pull up what I had noted. So within the national plans, one of the things that's really key for integrated care systems, I'm going to read this out, is integrated care systems can contribute to these national workforce plans by ensuring that the required growth and development is part of their workforce planning, supported by professional clinical leadership input from psychological professionals in their local and regional system. So this is a whole new structure and setup, and the role that I've I, I started off doing has been central really to linking with those workforce planners and then bridging and linking with the, all of the um, chief psychological professions officers within our region through both individual conversations, but through our psychological professions workforce steering group, which is held six every six to eight weeks. Now we brand it as the psychological uh, professionals workforce training and education group um, so that we've got because we have a broader in impact and reach than just just the word workforce alone. So in terms of what's been important here, and, and I don't think this is a si one size fits all. So there, there's been there's been kind of a lot of interest from different parts of the country around the roles that we've got here, because I think when I first started, I think I'm right in saying that my role was maybe the only one that had been jointly funded through um, human resources directors each putting money in from the, the trusts in the region and um, you know wanting to make sure that this dedicated resource to try and operationalize our strategy and work towards this expansion as I referenced earlier. So the role is very much about system coordination and leadership. I cannot do all of the work 
um, and I'm working with others to ensure that things, um, projects can be taken forward, um, things, um, I suppose, smoothing the way, but also championing this in ICS structures. So I'm part of the Integrated Care Systems New Roles Steering Group and have links into the Mental Health, Learning, Disability and Autism Workforce Council. So one of the things that um, I did early on, along with colleagues, is to really map the system and work out the different meetings, who sat where, form relationships with people, the different functions. And one of the things that, that within West Yorkshire was really clear was one of the, the work streams referenced earlier was community mental health transformation and this, the expansion under the psychological therapies for severe mental health problems. So I, that's the vehicle for delivery, but the roles very much could, that could be used in different integrated care systems as Rachel will go on to describe, that might not be the need. So there isn't a one size fits all, and it's very much about working what are the, and to what the priorities are within each individual system and responding to that local context. So as I said, there's a supportive role, supporting a whole range of different people, but also getting other people on board and championing different things that other people are doing. And I think Myron's maxims and system leadership have, have been really helpful to refer back to linking the system to different parts of itself. Okay, so I just want to tell you a couple of things that I've been doing, sort of how it's had impact. I couldn't possibly go into everything before I then hand over um, to, to Rachel so she can share more with you. Done. This is one of the um, data quality um, is referenced in the National Workforce Plan and, and in our local um, plan. It was our number one on our strategy, really, because we knew that our workforce data was not accurate. Um, we didn't even have occupational codes available for all psychological professions, which isn't surprising because we're growing and new professions have come on board, like the mental health wellbeing practitioners. So we started doing some work on this in, in West Yorkshire and recognised that in terms of the, the coding when people are employed, it's often done by HR colleagues or workforce colleagues or colleagues in payroll who aren't, don't have much time to, to code our workforce. And so sometimes that, that ends up being inaccurate. So we developed some local guidance to help them and thought that that training could help. We soon realised really that, that this was something that was of relevance across the country and knew that colleagues down in the southwest, um, PPN had already been doing some of this work and had cleansed their workforce data. And um, so it made sense really to reach out and start to think about doing something that was that was, that was joint. So when we'd finalised our coding guidance, we, we linked that through Sharon, um, our chair, to the national PPN colleagues and agreed that it was of, of use for, for wider and, and met with one of the strategy objectives on data quality nationally. So um, myself and um, Phil Self and the, the PPN chair in the Southwest and Adrian Whittington went through a process of agreeing the codes and finalising the psychological professions coding guidance together. That was kind of getting ready for relaunch for launch when we and um, when I I managed to find and it, it took a lot of digging and this is this is the persistence and I think having me enroll with the time that I could dedicate to this really meant that we could do something that did actually link to our um, national um, workforce data set. It's all highly technical. I didn't understand any of this when I first started. But through my network here in Leeds, I discovered how we could get in there, how we could get to work with our colleagues in the workforce standards team at NHS um, England. And through that process, working with them, we then were able to both get all the new professions um, that were nationally working nationally, code a actual occupational code within the occupational code manual, so we can now count them, and um, the um, update the the well actually you know, update the uh, the 
um, NHS Talk and Therapies for Anxiety Depression guidance, which was, was IAPT, but also have another piece of guidance that sits alongside that so that um, work in both at organisation level, ICS level, and importantly, um, for those staff coding us, we have that consistent guidance available. And um, I can send out um, links to anyone who's interested um, if you don't know about this already. So that's where we are, um, where we where we got to, but then we now need to make sure that our data is accurate. And we're in the process of doing that within um, the region now. Um, and um, I'm with, with some colleagues working with NHS England to develop a psychological professions workforce dashboard for the Northeast in Yorkshire, which will sit on the, um, on the Tableau system um, where we can get our workforce data. And this, this will enable us to report accurately on, on numbers of trainees, numbers of um, professions, sickness, retention rate. Um, so that, that's something that is ongoing, but in progress. So the second thing I wanted to let you know about was um, a, co a project that was started by some other colleagues, um, a North East Yorkshire project, a regional project, looking at supervision. So um, my colleagues, Laura Dixon, who's a consultant psychotherapist now within Bradford, Jess Anderson, who's one of the, the workforce team in South Yorkshire, and Zara Alson, who is an assistant psychologist working on the project, completed this work. So the problem, as I'm sure lots of you are aware, is, is that we've got this huge expansion target and these training places available, but the existing infrastructure has not always got capacity for the supervision and governance of these trainees, these additional trainees, and to support qualified psychological professionals. So this is a hidden capacity requirement and a cost to employers that um, has been you know, cited nationally. So the scope, so that these colleagues um, put a bid in and, and won funding from NHS England to look at this, um, this um, issue of supervisor capacity. Um, initially, this was around mapping across the whole of the region with a scope for working age adults, older people services, and early in onset and psychosis services. That was, refined because there's the for various different reasons which which I won't go into but the the I wanted to let you all know about the outputs of this project because there's a there's a long report with with many recommendations but two particular pieces of um documentation that that may be helpful to you so a supervision workforce planning support guide which looks or builds on the work again done in the southwest the courses that are available and what, are, what the requirements are in terms of for organisations for supervision and um, support of those, those professionals on those courses. And an innovation of note in the psychological professions supervision calculator, which is very fancy and allows you to put in the trainees or qualified staff you've got, and then it works out the number of hours um, of supervision capacity you, you would need um, as a minimum to support those people. So um, if you if you're interested in this, we can if you, you get in touch with um, either Sharon or Courtney, the PPN Northeast, we can send you the resources. So one of their recommendations when they did this work was to um, we'll know that that colleagues, I think some some of you may be on the call, have been um, developing supervision hubs in other parts of the country. And um, the regional project recommended that we pilot a supervision hub um, within our region. And um, again, Rachel and South Yorkshire colleagues have also been working on some on supervision and supervision hubs, which, which she'll uh, refer to in her in her section. So we agreed this proposal in West Yorkshire uh, that we'd we'd go forward and, and try and work this through. And that was supported by the Mental Health Learning Disability an autism workforce group within West Yorkshire integrated care system. So my focus here um, has been to really look at the operational viability and structures that are required to embed this longer term within the ICS structures and budgets, because we have funding that's there um, nationally for, for this, these supervisors, for this, these particular work streams, psychological therapies, severe mental health problems, 
but I guess none of us know what the future is. And I think that be, by getting involved and really trying to work with partners and see this as being a system problem, then hopefully it will be owned by the system. And then my, if we go forward with this, that it will be something that will be sustained and work for, for everybody. So I'm at the stage now where I'm involving those partners. Um, so, so we've got um, an SRO, um, Senior Responsible Officer, from one of the mental health trusts, one of the, the nursing professions directors. And we're um, just on the cusp, hopefully, of securing project management resource to help us um, work through the structural elements of the, of the hub. My colleagues are chomping at the bit because there's a lot of interest in this from especially from children and young people service clinical health psychology and i'm if this if we can get this off the ground one of the things i'm really um going to be quite really quite delighted to do is if this can help support the uptake of these posts within some of our vse organizations who maybe don't have that internal capacity that we have to um support these um places I want to say thank you as well to those who've um we've spoken to um Andrew, the other South, South Yorkshire workforce lead and myself um have given their time so that we can learn from you. So this includes Rachel from Cheshire and Wirral and also to Ben and Ross from the Midlands partnership. It's been really, really useful to learn from you and create bigger networks. So as I was in this post, I think there was there's I'm a bit of a kind of shiny new oh there's something new let's start this Sharon will be saying go we've got you know there's so many different things we can do it's literally like you look everywhere and we can have an impact and be involved and um it soon became really clear that half time or half time post there was there was no way that we could get involved everywhere within West Yorkshire and children and young people's not my background and um we really knew there was a huge gap. So um, one of the because the, the work that I'd been doing evaluated positively, we were um, successful in having um, other posts funded for the other ICSs within the northeastern Yorkshire. And one of those posts um, for the West Yorkshire one, um, Kath Davis was appointed to. So since Kath's been in post this March, um, I just want to showcase a little of what she's been doing, been up to. Um, it was really clear early on that the system um, and our partners operational clinical did not understand the new roles within children and young people services, both within the psychological professions and wider, and the governance of those roles. The um there's a key issue um, of children and young people with mental health or neurodiversity needs having and um, being looked after in um, inpatient and wider acute settings. And that being very difficult for the staff involved um, on those wards with different models and ways of working and different new roles being developed. So um, Kath's been doing quite a bit of work in, in that context to support um, at a strategic and leadership level those new roles and the governance of those new roles. It's the, the population of children we're talking about here are um, children with mental health problems who are in acute paediatric beds, but also children with long term health conditions who are more likely to have mental health problems and comorbidity and epilepsy, diabetes. So this um, needs a more consistent resourced involvement at a strategic and operational level. And um, Kath's been, as I said, we're working on that. She's also developing some um, new high placements within the VSSE. So two placements have come on board for clinical psychology trainees and continues to develop qualified posts in that area. One of the, again, referenced in the national plan, leadership is so crucial within services for psychological professionals. And it's been noted that um, within children and young people services, um, the leadership structures maybe across the region had um, 
diminished over time. So CAF set up a regional forum for um, service leads to get together and start to learn from each other and network and, um, and address these problems, retention being a huge problem um, within CAMS and WIDER. So um, again, looking at, uh, we've been working all, all of us together really, but, but, but on career path development and widening participation work with going to careers fairs for, for to to attract a, a wider um, population into these new roles and doing um, some in, innovative work with Speakers for Schools, um, which is a national organisation that's all about getting work experience out there um, and information to children from state schools and colleges. Last thing on here is looking in the early stages, think of developing um, a competency framework for mental health um, in schools teams for, for the education based mental health practitioners um, alongside colleagues at North Northumbria University um, and has been working on that workforce planning toolkit. I can't answer detailed questions about this. Um, Kath apologises she's not here. It's her birthday today, so she's gone off to do something exciting. We just always have a rule if we can not to work on um, your birthday. So it's, I think it's my last slide now before, before I hand it over to Rachel for a bit of variation here. But as I said before I introduced Kath, um, the, the work that we've been doing in West Yorkshire highlighted how uh, useful for us here in this region having this workforce lead in post. Uh, providing this additional resource and system leadership has been. And so we were um, pleased to receive funding from um, HE as well as to support um, workforce leads in the other um, ICSs across the region. So here we all are. We've got um, Elizabeth Darwell, who is um, in Humber in North Yorkshire, that huge area there um, on, on, on the East Coast. We've got Marku, um, who has recently started with us in, in September, covering that another huge area in the northeast and North Cumbria. And we've got Rachel, um, who's obviously here today, and Andrew covering um, South Yorkshire. Lots of people live in South Yorkshire, I think, Rachel, but a smaller, smaller geographical area. And then I thought West Yorkshire was big, but, you know, um, not 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 quite as geographically large, which has its challenges. But a, a lot of people um, in, our, in our area, we've got myself and Kath. And also, um, I think one of the one of the things that, that maybe um, is being highlighted tomorrow in the in-person day is around the role of health and physical health. Um, our work as psychological professions, physical health settings. So we do have within West Yorkshire, um, a, so that colleagues within the West Yorkshire Acute Association of Trusts, otherwise known as WIAT, so that's a, there's a collaborative, collaborative there. They have just recently um, agreed to fund a 0.6 consultant um, post for um, clinical health psychology areas um, in terms of their workforce. So there'll be a workforce lead post being advertised soon um, to work alongside Kath and I within that important area, the pathways that um, go from primary care into physical health care and across closely working with us um, so that we're, we're not overlapping in function. OK, so. I just want to hand you over to Rachel now, who will tell us a bit about what she and Andrew have been doing in South Yorkshire since they started. Well, Rachel, you started in March, I think. Andrew joined you a bit later on. So over to you. Let me know when you want me to scroll on on the slides. Yeah, thank you. So, um, yeah, in South Yorkshire, we've got um, two half time roles. So I started in March and Andrew started in June. Um, they're fixed term roles at the moment. They're um, funded through um, HE as was um, now the workforce training and education part of NHS England. Um, so when I came into post um, in March, it was slightly different from the context from when um, Gail came into her post in that there wasn't already um, a psychological professions um, workforce plan. Um, so very much when I started um, 
what I needed to do and was asked to do was to do some um, initial scoping um, to look at what some of the um, challenges were for the psychological professions workforce, um, what some of the development areas might be. And from that, I developed um, six action areas, um, which were then agreed by the um, lead psychological professions from the different um, trusts in South Yorkshire. Um, so two action areas um, are more clinically focused and um, are around gaps within particular settings and four are about the psychological professions workforce more broadly. Um, so what I thought I'd do is, is give you a sense of what those action areas are and some of the, the different things that we've been doing as part of those action areas. Um, and you'll see that there's some um, overlaps with some of the work that Gail and Kath have been doing in West Yorkshire, um, because I guess some of these themes are, are common across um, psychological professions across all different areas, and some are a bit more um, South Yorkshire specific. Um, so the first action area is around workforce data. Um, the second one's around um, roles, which is quite a broad theme, but thinking about all different aspects of psychological professional roles and identity within the workplace. There's one around training, around supervision, and then the two clinical ones, are um, physical health settings and pre-pregnancy to age five. And I will tell you a little bit about some of the things that we've been doing in those different action areas. Um, but I suppose I just wanted to um, highlight as well that um, although the funding at the moment is um, fixed term, um, we are preparing a business case and what we're hoping is that the roles will be made permanent and funded um, within the South Yorkshire ICS. So I'm going to have a go and see if I can forward the slide myself. Yes, Cam, that's good. OK, so um, in terms of just some of the examples, I'm not going to go into um, any of them in detail. Um, rather, um, I thought give you more of a, of a sense of, of kind of some of the different things. So um, obviously Gail's told you quite a bit already around um, workforce data and some of the challenges around that. So in South Yorkshire, um, we've been looking at some of the current sources of data, thinking about the strengths and weaknesses, um, and really trying to get a sense of, of who have we got in the workforce um, and, you know, where are some of the challenges there? So, um, you know, thinking about things like um, diversity and um, how um, representative the psychological professions workforce is of the population. Um, thinking about have we got any specific um, groups within the psychological professions workforce where we've got challenges, maybe because there's a large number of people maybe approaching retirement age. At the moment, we've not um, fully answered some of those questions just because the data is not accurate enough, but hopefully with some of the work that is going on um, around coding and some of the dashboards that are being created, hopefully that will start to um, become a bit clearer for us. A um, few examples of things that we've been doing under the professional roles um, action area. Um, so I've been involved in a project about the experiences of trainee clinical psychologists um, on their child placements, and that's across um, the Sheffield Leeds and Hull courses. So that's wider than, than South Yorkshire. Um, and Kath's been involved in that project as well. Um, so looking at their experiences of their child placements and the impact that this may have on recruitment um, post qualification. And what I'm hoping to do is to um, take that on a stage in South Yorkshire, specifically working with the with the Sheffield course, thinking about um, all of the, the placements that trainees might go on um, through their um, first couple of years um, in training and how that might impact on their choices around their third year placements and from there on into um, their qualified placements, uh, qualified posts, because um, obviously that um, has a bearing on our recruitment and uh, workforce planning going forward. Um, I think as um, Gail's already mentioned there was um, a school's discovery session so so Gail was very much um, part of that but it, it was um, our South Yorkshire ICB schools engagement team um, that helped us in, in thinking about um, how we convey some of the information around um, psychological professional roles um, to an audience um, that was primarily 16, 17 year olds who maybe haven't got that wider sense of the world of work and so on. How do we um, distill down a really complicated professional group um, into something that makes sense and is engaging um, for those young people who might be thinking about a role um, in the future working in, in one of the psychological professions. Um, 
to tie in with this week, um, I've also been um, doing a piece of work um, around some of the psychological professional roles that we have in South Yorkshire. So promoting um, all of the different roles that there are, all of the different settings that psychological professions might work in um, across our different trusts and, and other settings. Um, I'm really trying to get that message out there. And I think that's got different functions. So some of it's about trying to attract um, new people to the psychological professions, but it's also about sharing um, the role that we have in different um, services and the, the value that we can bring to those services to help um, increase um, that awareness within within the wider um, workforce and, and those those different settings. Um, thinking about training, again, a variety of different things. So that first one, that's a bit of a plug because we've actually got a, a webinar on this on Thursday as part of Psychological Freshens Week. Um, so it's it's mainly a Midlands PPN project um, and it's around developing um, on from, from um, some work that they'd done a few years ago around skills transfer and developing that on into an e-learning module to be disseminated nationally. So this is very much about making the most of the training that psychological professionals might go on. So thinking about all of the things that need to be planned and considered before someone starts training, during their training and after their training to really ensure that um, everything that they've learned, they can fully bring into their clinical practice in the most effective way. Because um, I think, you know, we've all known examples of someone going on training and actually the context um, isn't well considered enough so when they come back off that training they're not really able to use all of the skills that they've learned and that's such a, a waste within within the workforce and in terms of of NHS resources so um, the skills transfer e-learning modules really tries to um, help people think about all of the different aspects that need to be considered um, to make the most of that training. I've been working with the um, Sheffield Declan Cycles um, consulting um, on their proposed um, changes to placement so um, really providing um, a more systems and service perspective on some of the proposed changes and how that might work in practice um, and again together with with Gail and other um, of our workforce lead colleagues um, contributing decision making around offers for NHS England funded training places so Again, this is a project that, that um, Gail's been very much involved with as well. So thinking about um, supervision, so within South Yorkshire, um, Andrew has taken on the leadership of an existing project to map supervision needs and availability, and then um, exploring some of the supervision hub models, um, thinking about some of the, the work that's already underway in other regions that's a bit further ahead um, and the different approaches that, that might be taken with a view to creating something. And I think this is still very much a work in progress. So whether it's a South Yorkshire hub, whether it's a South Yorkshire and West Yorkshire combined hub, whether it's bigger than that, I think those are all still still options to, to think about at the moment. Um, so that's that's an ongoing piece of work. So then thinking about the two more clinically focused areas, um, as Gail has already mentioned, um, physical health is a, is a really important area. It's certainly it's coming through in lots of the national guidance documents as an area um, for growth and expansion. Um, and that was coming through very clearly when I came into post that that felt like a real gap. Um, and across South Yorkshire that there were some inequities um, between the four places that we have. Um, with one place being, being much um, better resourced in terms of, of psychological professionals working into physical healthcare settings than the other three, but still even that, that better resourced place having some gaps as well. Um, so this is a project that Andrew's been, been working on. Um, so I, I started some of the work because I was in post first, but developing those connections with the key stakeholders in the different trusts and within the ICB. Um, and I guess because of it being physical health settings, it's it's also working with those trusts that maybe don't have psychological professionals at the moment, the acute trusts, um, building up those connections there. So that's taken quite a lot of time because we're not necessarily um, naturally coming into um, contact with some of those people. So it's very much a more proactive um, engagement and, and developing of relationships. Um, so we've identified some really clear gaps um, and now the work's underway to think about possible structures um, and I think 
really looking at how can we do that at a more departmental level. I think previously there's maybe been um, odd posts um, that felt quite isolated and been hard to recruit to and, and retain people in. So really what we're recognising is we need to look at something a bit bigger than that. Obviously, that's a much bigger piece of work and it's going to need a lot more collaboration and thought put into it. But I think certainly the, the interest and the enthusiasm is there for really thinking about how can we how can we do this? How can we really grow the, the workforce in that setting? So then the area that I've been working on um, is is around pre-pregnancy to age five so um it goes across um physical health care settings mental health care settings from adult services to children's services um and when i came into post what i was hearing was that um it felt like there were some services there but there were maybe some gaps um but even the services that were there maybe weren't as well connected as they could be so what I've been working on is trying to um, increase those connections. So um, as Gail was saying earlier, that bridge, being able to um, connect people in different settings, um, people in different places, maybe doing similar similar roles, um, and really try to identify some of those areas of good practice um, and increase the, the level of collaboration between services. Um, through, through that mapping of um, what services that we've got, um, it's also um, led to a specific piece of work with the ICB um, around infant mental health and really trying to develop services in that area because we've certainly got some, got some gaps there. Um, so I hope that's given a sense of some of the range of, of projects. I thought I'll go for, for giving you a sense of lots of different things that we've been doing rather than going into anything in any depth. Um, but obviously, if there are specific questions, um, you know, and we've got time later on, then I'm, I'm happy to talk a bit further about any of those those areas. Otherwise, I will hand back to Gail at this point. Thank you, Rachel. It's really it was so wonderful when um, Rachel was the first person to join me in this role. So having somebody else um, to, to join up and meet up with has been really fantastic. I would say that within, within our roles, we do get together on a monthly basis in an action learning set so that we can share challenges, learn from each other and um, plan um, what we, we may do together. And I think that that's um, certainly, I think, been a good model for making the best use of our resources. So um, I was diverted slightly while Rachel was talking because I've actually forgotten which bridge this is. I know it's um, I know it's in South Yorkshire, but I don't know. So um, but that doesn't really matter, does it? It's a complex bridge here with a bit in the middle that's that's made of metal and sort of joins these two stone sides and um, I don't know what that says, but basically our interface, as Rachel said, with our colleagues, um, Mike being um, one of those key colleagues in the NHSE workforce training and education team. Mike's described me certainly as a critical friend um, and there as a in, in a facilitative collegiate enabling role, which sometimes can involve, um, you know, really gathering information and data from the wider trusts. Um, so to make the best use of the opportunities which come out sometimes maybe with not much time, let's say. So the system knowledge that I've developed over my time with my colleagues um, really does help make sure the information gets to the right people. Um, and if someone happens to be on leave, I know who else to go to so that we can. And, and I, th I think that's that's kind of sounds small, but actually can make quite a big difference, actually. And our input, put up, as Rachel said, you know, things are changing. Workforce planning is now coming through the ICB. And, you know, with, certainly we are fortunate because we are very much linked into the, the ICB in terms of our links with our mental health workforce um, lead, Sonia. And, um, you know, those links are developing for the my colleagues in the other parts of the region. But um, because making sense of the multi-educational training investment portfolio work I think I um, can't remember what the P stands for Metip, but sense checking that not doing it but sense checking it and triaging the applications that come in for the variety of funded psychological professions initiatives I think that has been um, invaluable to, to our colleagues in that team do you, do you want to say any more Mike about that before I move on if I may just very briefly yep um, the Gail and her colleagues work in this has been invaluable to us um, as 
we are in what used to be HE are really focused around commissioning and delivering numbers of placements and training places, but we don't always have the full knowledge of who needs them. So to be able to, to have a critical friend to look at what we're proposing and say, well, you need to focus this offer on certain areas or as uh, Gail says, to triage the bids for some of the initiatives is really valuable to us. Um, the number of training offers that come out, we are certainly working on reducing the number and frequency of those uh, coming out, but in assisting with that, we it's certainly reduced the amount of attrition in people taking up places, and we seem to be getting a lot better at getting the training to the people who need it. Without these roles, our job would certainly be a lot harder. And uh, if you are from other ICBs in other parts of the country, I can only highly recommend that you look at adopting a similar model. Just pass back to you here. Thanks, Mike. Um, so I just we just put what we're not. We're not magicians. And I think that's kind of like this is really tough work. And it does it does take a certain level of resilience, actually, because you sometimes are stopping things from happening. People come up with all sorts of ideas, but they haven't read the strategy. You're going around saying, well, actually, that doesn't fit with the strategy. Or have you thought of this? We're not workforce planners for mental health. Um, and, you know, there's a high degree of technical information um, and skill um, required in those roles. Um, but we, we do work with them. Um, now, I have been introduced as being the chief, some, not quite the chief psychological professional in West Yorkshire, but I am definitely not that. Um, and um, I think being really clear on the role boundary and around what we're there to do in terms of workforce and getting parts of the system linked up is is really important to define that in, in, in you know correctly and certainly what Mike referenced earlier we're not making decisions without those networks and that close link to our CPPO colleagues but we are reducing I think making communication more straightforward with those people. So as Rachel said, our roles are ICS wide, but each place has different needs. I think the principal, um, our chief um, chief executive or chair, I can never remember the titles of our ICS, Rob Webster, talks about subsidiarity, which is a political principle, which is that we're the ICB there to serve um, places, but not do things for them. If it's, if it's um, best to do it at a place, we can do stuff where it adds value. So each place has different needs. And I think the, the, the kind of some of the principles, principles here about equity, not equality, which are challenging in terms of funding and the way things um, work currently. But, but in terms of our time, we, through our mapping, might then need to offer more of our time into specific projects at diff in different places at different points. But again, that would be in, in West Georgia, anyway, be agreed through the small group of us working together and the wider group in terms of this, the West Yorkshire steering group. So only a couple more slides left now. Um, so lots of challenges you can imagine. Um, mentioned the first two already, but just, you know, where do you, where do you focus your time? I think it was really important for, for us, especially with pilot roles, to, to get things that, that to, to finishing point um, and having those short term projects that you can really get some impact. But it's also important to have longer term projects as well underway, sort of things like the supervision hub I've put into that category. Um, it's really um, where we sit. I think each what we're discovering in the action learning set is each, you know, each of our contexts is very different, has developed very differently, has got different priorities um, within the ICSs and really working out where you need to be because you could be in endless meetings all the time and, and nobody necessarily not with the right people and not making the, the, the important impact. Um, connections and influence. Again, I don't know whether it'd like somebody to evaluate me externally about my connections and influence, but certainly I think it's that having that radar and really um, things using now the X, so Twitter, um, to connect with people and um, find out what other people do. And they really are keen to have us on board. Um, it does take time to become embedded. I think colleagues have really, really helped me and Kath within West Yorkshire 
because they already um, had a really clear role about um, a, a vision about wanting, uh, realising the importance of psychological professions. So colleagues like Sonia mentioned, but also Joe Butterfield would, you know, it's made it so easier, much easier to get embedded within the, the wider mental health, learning disability and autism team. Um, there's a lot of variation between different ICBs and I think one of the challenges, you know, as um, is around permanency and funding. If we look at the, um, the the national documentation, you know, the ambition's huge and, you know, having an 18 month or year long funded post is not is not going to be enough. And so but being able to actually advocate and find mechanisms like we've done in West Yorkshire so that it is a permanent role then allows us to actually work on projects over the longer period of time and the people do know who we are so they come to us with relevant information. There's loads of advantages to these roles I think specifically as well within this broader group of having other people doing the similar things. There's dedicated time to get things done, the data project. You know, I think colleagues nationally had known for years and years and years that we needed a coding manual for psychological professions outside um, IAP does was. But they just did not have the time to put into to doing that um, doing that work. But so I was with those colleagues able to pick it up and we really did do it really collaboratively and collectively with um, the NHS workforce standards too. Um, Mike said, you know, having this overview and external perspective um, on the work that colleagues are doing um, within um, the workforce training and education team and being able to link other people up. So knowing that we've got a project um, in West Yorkshire called Pathways to Progression, which is um, about career development for assistant psychologists um, to come into um, get um, high quality CPD, but also to develop the competencies needed to develop a KSA portfolio so they can go on to potentially be CBT therapists and open up that career path pipeline. Now, knowing that, you know, um, knowing somebody over there had a platform already um, that could be used and partnering with the, with that university um, saved a lot of money and also made it um, easier to scale that up and work together. So those connections, having your radar out all the time to, to know what people are doing. Um, and yeah, but it has this these kind of support enable being flexible and again bridging it's this lovely bridge here. That's cool. So I think it's now question time. So hopefully you've been putting some questions in the chat. They haven't popped up and annoyed me, which I'm now thankful to Sharon, who suggested we used Q&A, not chat. It's it's 100 percent better when you're presenting to um, not have the chat popping up. I'll stop sharing. We'll see what's come through, Sharon. Um, not a huge amount yet. Thank you so much. There was a lot of information there. And I yeah, think loads. <laughs> and it was just really great to get a taste of the different things that you can do in this role. Um, there was one question in the chat asking specifically about the tariff. I hope I've answered that correctly about about um, using clinical psychology trainees in the voluntary care sector. Um, do they get the tariff? Um, do the, the, the VCSC get the tariff if, the, if no, I can't click on the things that are working? I think I've answered that. Yep, um, uh, if I can just come in on that. Yep, VCs are eligible for payment to the tariff. The DCLIN psych posts are, I believe, fully salary supported anyway. But yes, the tariff also comes into play. I suppose, yeah, I suppose it's where their predominant, um, where their supervisor sits yeah or is it uh, it's following the trainee i suppose it, it, a lot of it follows the trainee however the the one lie in the ointment is that if we don't currently have a, a contract with the vcse to be able to pay them the yeah. uh the, the lead time for getting contracts set up is quite yeah. lengthy at the moment and i imagine most of our products have been where the lead we not the lead provider, we are the organisation hosts and we then, um, trainees then go into VCSE sectors from their kind of trust provider placements and that's how we kind of work in West Yorkshire in a way. Yeah. But um, yeah, so are there any, um, are there any questions? Anybody have any questions or reflections on the, pre on the presentation this afternoon? I'm going to open it up because there are only a few of us on and it might be a bit easier. So if people raise their hands, Marianne. 
Hi there. Um, I just had a question for Rachel, um, which was whether you'd had, oh, I suppose for any any of you, but I was thinking particularly of Rachel and what she was talking about in terms of physical health and whether you've had any contact with community health trusts, because I noticed as a psychologist working in a community health trust that when people talk about physical health, they tend to think of the acute trusts, but actually there's so much need in the community health trusts with kind of nurses, OTs, speech and language therapists, physios going into the home of people, often people with trauma, complex mental health problems and having to deliver their services there. And I think it's a, it's a real gap and somewhere where, where, you know, there's a real kind of psychology need. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's more a project that um, my colleague Andrew's been working on than myself. Um, and I think I would be accurate in saying he hasn't had any contact with community trusts at the moment. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. And I think, you know, it's there's there's so many layers, aren't there? And and kind of, yeah, where the, where the need is. And I think it is um, very much a growing area. And I think, you know, particularly with some of the um, community mental health transformation as well, and the primary care hubs, that's a different setting again. And maybe um, some of those um, people are in that setting, but not necessarily all of them. So I think, yes, it is very much about um, trying to think about all of the different places and, and kinds of settings but I guess yeah you have to start somewhere <laughs> um yeah sometimes it's where where people are shouting the loudest is where you start but yeah very much needing to to kind of continue on that that journey as well yeah I just find they're often a bit forgotten <laughs> so that's why I wanted to highlight it thank you yeah, Marianne, I'll come in there as well. I think we've got um, in Leeds, so in our West Yorkshire patch, there's one community trust, Leeds Community Healthcare. And um, I think um, we are, we are, we, so there's there's ICS structures and regional local structures. One of our West Yorkshire um, strategy objectives is to have, suggest we have place, boards at place, psychological um, professions boards. So we do have one in, in Leeds. It's been running over a year and we link in with the community and acute and uh, trusts and VSE all come together at that board level. And so in terms of and then each of us in those in those leadership positions has other roles in different or parts of the system and organisation, which I think so it's, it's got this ICS network and then regional and um, regional network and place based networks. And I think so I, I sit on the clinical care and professional leadership um, board for the ICS and then bring back the learning and um, the, the kind of initiatives on that link with our 10 priorities in West Yorkshire to the relevant people in the vet in the in different places as best I can so in terms of the West Yorkshire obesity strategy that link to all the, the, the psychological professions working in the community trust but I, I do think it'd be, it'd be interesting to potentially talk to you so drop me your email um, about community trusts in general because they were excluded from the from the our, our census national census um which which we did highlight nationally and how I, I would hope that that they're included because certainly in our community trust there are huge numbers of psychological professionals because they have NHS talking therapies as well as CAMs so it just really depends again on local context and how things are configured um I can loads of other services there but we are well aware in West Yorkshire and linked to those people and trying to you know champion leadership um, and disability so thanks for your question any other questions or reflections we'll be stunned you into silence because it was so impressive <laughs> I, I've got a question. Is that okay? Sorry, I didn't put my hand up. Is it okay? To ask? <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I might, I might have missed this information. Um, but uh, I suppose you know, if if I think about how the ICSs have sort of um, come about and the way that trust used to work, not necessarily in competition with each other, but for some reason, it, it doesn't make sense to me. It's all the NHS. So if you've got a contract, great, go, I'll crack on with that work. It's not there's no need for me to have that contract. But you do have some of that going on. You know, who's got the contract for for the acute trust to do bariatrics and who's who's get you know, when you've got a lot of a few trusts in one area. 
So I might have missed this, but how how did you sort of decide who you know were these jobs advertised and then and then a psychologist um, applied for them, and then how did you experience the sort of um, did you find that people were just coming together and 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 working well together, or was there a bit of no, I can't describe it. Did I? Shall I take that? Because I suppose mm. it kind of started in West Yorkshire. So what you're talking about is not necessarily a PPN thing. Um, the workforce leaders across the region have started, but our different ICSs are in different places. And I think a lot of this is relational. So in West Yorkshire, there are four mental health trusts, uh, no, three, three mental health trusts and um, the acute trust, the WIAT, and we came together and um, and this has been going since about 2020. So I'm a CPPO in the Leeds Mental Health Trust. I chair the Psychological Professions Workforce Training, Education and Steering Group. And I suppose we meet as um, mental health trust leads on a regular basis and work together. So we've been working together, meeting regularly, and we've worked on our relationship. So we kind of, the way that we've chosen to work has been really transparent. So um, we... Uh, you know, there are there there aren't so many times we're in competition, to be fair, in the mental health mm -hmm. trust. It doesn't quite work for that. But I imagine if you're in a specialist tier for acute service where you are, it may be different in acute health. But I think it's about the principles and values that we hold about how we're going to do the work. Mm -hmm. So we're really explicit about that in West Yorkshire, how we as heads of service are choosing to work together, how we will raise what a some kinds can be tricky issues we may not resolve them but we'll raise them and talk about them so I think a lot of it's maturity of the working relationships within your system and I don't mean that in a in a patronizing way I think it is it is what it is and and there's a lot of work and a girl went to a system convener workshop this is about relationships this is about how you have conversations how you think about equity how you think about values and principles and certainly I, I think it feels more of a challenge for our clinical health in our acute trust um I think there's something about putting that on the table mm. uh and talking it's about <laughs> it's like a, it's a different way of working isn't it and, that, and some areas Absolutely. have moved on quickly and created those yeah. uh integrated systems and and it's working effectively and then there's some of us that are like are we actually doing this or aren't we a part of it or who's leading on it and are waiting to be steered. But it's that sort of um, not thinking about it in terms of a, a trust a silo within the trust, but thinking, OK, how are we working as a whole area? Like, yeah, so I think, I think that's and what sometimes, I'm trying to understand. And sometimes I think as psychologists, we can sit and wait for someone to perhaps tell us what to do. And I don't think you should. We should just seize the opportunity. And that's how the work in West Yorkshire began. And that's how we got the workforce leads across the regions. We saw an opportunity. We saw something that worked. We liaised with our NHSE colleagues as a proof of a proof of concept. And that's how we've got the spread across the region. I do think there's something of being quite proactive in this space. And there is something about, for me, in terms of how, um, uh, because people aren't used to, don't understand our profession because it's so complex no one's going to really I think come and say we'd like you to do x I think we kind of have to have sharp elbows and think about what we this is the work that we can do we can get involved and I think there is something then about our leadership development across all the different profession or across all the different profession, professions developing leadership but also being really strategic and work and thinking how we do this together and I think the values and principles of the PPN really reinforce that which is how do we work together to maximise the benefit for the public and that can only be by doing it together. Yeah and I think that's so much better it, you know, it sounds positive to so sort of thinking rather than as groups but an overall collective across an area yeah. so. And it, and it may be in your region that you might want to it may be that you may want to do some development work because I think this is a cultural shift. I think mm -hmm. I think if we're going to get to a different place, this is a significant cultural shift in the way we work. Gail? Yeah, thanks, Thank Sharon. You. Just just to add to what Sharon's saying, within West Yorkshire, there's a the West Yorkshire Acute Association Trust, Association of Acute Trusts. So and that's the that's separate. But I, I I just thought they always have this, but they don't. And I, I don't know whether where you work, whether you've got that kind of um, structure set up already across the acute trust so that they can work together and share practice. And I think this is realised 
in our clinical and care professional forum so that when somebody comes up with we want to develop a service for um, maybe a new type of scan um, they are doing it for West Yorkshire so they are thinking about yes we might do it in Leeds but actually how is this going to be open uh, access to the other populations mm. and they're looking far more at hub and spoke models and so there's a real this is what I was saying about Sharon saying about culture change mm. which is huge and um, certainly we're doing quite a lot of work on that culture of the ICB ICS for this language in terms of how we move from a more competitive tendering environment yeah. to a collaborative because yes. it's it, it does test relationships but and those relationships are, are really key so yeah, agree with everything Sharon said. Thank you, that's helpful. And I think, and I think as we're saying, it's a model that we're doing at place. So we do it in the lead system. So we're working with our VCSE colleagues to share the training, support in accessing the training, thinking about clinical pathways within leads, but also doing it at an ICS level and also that kind of cult, uh, regional level. How do we work as a region together, hence the ESR, um, looking at ESR, getting that right, thinking about the benchmarking data, the regional dashboard, and starting to think about the supervision hub and thinking, how do we do with that as an ICS? Is there an, any applicability to it being done at, at a regional level? So we're, we're always, <laughs> I think, working um, at different levels in the system. Thank you. Any other, any other questions? Has anybody got be interesting? Is there anybody working in a similar way across? I know we've got people here from across England, I think. Is anybody and I know some of these workforce leads roles have been um are in trust rather than at an ICF ICS level. So we've seen them advertised in trust. Um it'll be interesting to think what the difference might be between the trust, how they operate in trust and how they operate at an ICS level. Is there anybody here doing that role? Okay. Uh, Kirsty, hi, Kirsty. Hi, Sharon. Sorry, my my camera is not working for me today. Um, yeah, I've just started um, at the beginning of September as a workforce lead for the psychological professions in in a trust in Langston, South Cumbria. Um, so, but only in, in September. So, obviously, it's quite it's quite new and still still finding my feet. Um, and I guess I was really curious about, so obviously that's going to be quite different, the role as the role emerges, I feel that that's going to be quite different, but obviously some overlaps um, in terms of the, the projects that you've been describing today. But there's going to be some differences in the sense of, you know, there's not going to be that reach into the um, integrated care systems. And I guess I guess I was uh, apologies. I was a little bit late joining so I couldn't get my link to work. But um, I guess I was just kind of curious about how you might have kind of got that buy in at the kind of integrated care system level for these posts in the first place. Like where did that sort of sort of genesis of that kind of idea you know come from because I think it I think it's great to have it within trust but I think if we don't have that kind of workforce planning at ICS ICB level you know I think that could be problematic so I was just curious about that you know where that genesis kind of came from in the first place do you want to take that Sharon um um, um, I think it started, I think it started at the pandemic, uh, really, there was a recognition, I think, if I'm honest, we, we, when we came together um, and the need, the importance of psychological, psychologists and psychological interventions during the pandemic was when I think we, um, when there was an increased interest in what we had to offer, if I'm honest. Mm -hmm. And it was about taking the opportunity to kind of say, this is what we can do. Um, it's not just about Resilience Hub. There was a lot of work supporting teams, supporting, if you remember, so how do we support teams working mental health trust, thinking about psychological support for teams, thinking a lot about trauma and the impact of trauma. And um, and we stepped into the space, I think, as psychological professions, certainly in West Yorkshire and nationally. And from there, I think we just are saying to the colleague, just we took, um, we got sharp elbows. I've got sharp elbows. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that and um, 
saying and it kind of evolved it was organic so none of this is part is necessarily until recently on a page anywhere it was about having conversations forging relationships understanding the system and structures and often they don't make sense let's be clear Gail did a lot of mapping but I think it's fair to say that sometimes these things still don't make sense how mm. different groups relate to each other who does what when where if I'm honest um mm. gosh this is being recorded isn't it and I forgot I'm wearing my PPN hat <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm not wearing my CPPO hat I'm wearing my PPN hat <laughs> but sometimes I think it's a complex territory to navigate so um and I think it's about seeing the opportunities understanding the landscape um and just going for it really and see and making the best of opportunities and, and it's kind of evolved yep. so I think it's absolutely for, for me one of the major things was meeting with the CEO of your ICB, of your ICS, which is Rob Webster, who's a real rock star in our ICS in terms of the values that he holds really resonate with the way we operate. It was meeting the medical director and the nursing director within your ICS, um, because depending where you are, you may report directly by a professional line, either to your medical director or your nursing director. And often it was to the extent in our ICS, um, our medical directors thought we were aligned with AHPs. So I didn't really have an understanding of the psychological professions in a professional sense. So we take these things, I think, for granted. And I think it's really explaining to people what we do, where we are, what we have to offer. Is that? If, if I can just come in on the back of that. Uh, in HEE, as was, we saw the huge advantages of these roles uh, because it's looking at the training uh, offers and the quality of HE side and the quality drivers that NHSE look at from their side, looking at both of those things from a single lens of the service and across the piece, it pulls it all together. Uh, because very often we're very focused on just what the training offer is. They're just focused on, on what the outputs are. And you've got to look at how you pull all that together. Mm -hmm. well, the benefits of having that kind of role across the piece uh, for an ITB or even just within a trust are demonstrable, I think. Um, we, and we certainly managed to find some uh, funding to roll out the pilot further to other ICBs so that we could, they could be tested and hopefully embedded in those regions. And from that aspect, uh, your contact over in Northwest, am I right in thinking you're Northwest? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, would be Kay Halliwell, and I can drop yes. her email. Do you know? Do you know Kay? Yeah, I do know Kay. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. Kay, Kay might be the person to speak to at uh, at regional level about anything there, and I'll have a word with her myself from our side. Thank you. I think the challenge for us is we don't have the infrastructure like our nursing and medical colleagues have in terms of training and workforce. It's really clear. So when you're working in NHSE, WTNE, you can see the kind of professional and clinical leadership within those mm. different professions and increasingly the AHP our AHP colleagues, there isn't that infrastructure for psychological professions. Mm. And, and Adrian's, Adrian and Gita have done an absolutely brilliant job getting us to this point with the uh, with, with the with the national clinical lead. I think Gita's on the call. But and um so we so we've got there, but we still need we need to start developing the infrastructure if we're going to deliver against this workforce plan. And I think what we have in West Yorkshire feels um well what we have in the region at the moment it feels like a really interesting structure that we can develop but still very fragile because most of them are temporary posts so let's be clear this is the only one or two are substantive but the rest are temporary posts and I suppose what we would try and do what we're keen to do in North East Yorkshire is trying to move those into substantive positions that can give us an infrastructure to enable us to deliver against the workforce plan on Friday afternoon um, Adrian's going to talk about the NHS long-term workforce plan and what it means for the psychological professions to be able to deliver against that we really need to have a much more I think firmer infrastructure. Then Agita if you're still on if, you, if there's anything you'd like to add to that am I putting you on the spot? Put me on the spot because I've just about <laughs> got to go and get my train to London Sharon so you've literally got two minutes before I turn my computer off. Um, Absolutely. I just agree with everything you've said. And I think just picking up on 
what you were saying about contacts within the ICSs. I think with a range of hats on, no particular one, there are quite a lot of variation in terms of how the different ICBs respond to psychological professions. And certainly I know from the Northwest, um, not all are as enthusiastic as some of the others are. And I think that presents real challenges in terms of creating those relationships to actually take these things forward. So, and I think that's where certainly the national infrastructure, the PPNs and the the Workforce and Training and Education Directorate can really support the psychological professions in terms of getting that voice into the ICBs. So that's probably the only thing I'd add to that. But thanks, Sharon. Thank I, I will go now because I don't want to miss my <laughs> train. So thanks. See you. Lovely to see you. Yeah, and you. Okay. All right. I imagine you're going to the London event tomorrow. Um, so we're coming up to the last five minutes. Are there any final reflections or points whilst you've got our presenters here today? OK, well, listen, thank you so much for coming. Um, um, they'll, I think some of the documents that Gail referred to are, will be on the North East Yorkshire um, website, PPM website, I think. Uh, if they're not there, they will be there soon. Um, I think Gail and um, Gail and I wouldn't say Gail will be happy for you to contact her. I'll say that happy for you to get in touch if you've got any queries um, and also Mike. Listen, it's been, thank you so much, Gail, Rachel, Mike. It's been a brilliant afternoon and thank you all for coming. Um, thank you. Yeah.